Order. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today. As uh, Jennifer mentioned, I'm the director of the Compact Scholars Program. I am not a professor, and I do not have to do what you do every day. So I welcome um, the opportunity to learn from you and from your work here today. It's been really interesting for me to sit back and, and listen, sort of like the fly on the wall, and hear about some of the challenges that you're facing in your classroom. My challenge as a student services professional is to support students in their learning and support them in their pathways to graduation. So I know earlier today was mentioned the fact that students come with a lot of variables into your classrooms. And that is true. And my job is to address some of those variables so that the students can be equipped to learn and succeed in, in your classroom and meeting your expectations. So today, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of our initiatives here on campus that support student success. One in particular is called the Commuter Student Success Initiatives, focusing on learning communities. And I have to give you some context about where this pilot uh, effort evolved. And part of that is in alignment with our strategic plan. The, you know, the university president has made it very clear that student success is important to all of us and particularly in looking at the achievement of commuter students who we have identified as being at-risk students. And when I say at-risk, I mean they're least likely to graduate in the same manner that someone who's lived on campus their first year. So for a commuter student definition today, we're talking about the first year freshmen, that is living at home with their parents and commuting to campus versus their peers who have the benefits of residential education, the residential learning communities living on campus. So what we've tried to do, and I say we because this is a collaborative effort between academic affairs and student affairs, is to create some commuter learning communities where we can sort of learn from the benefits of having that interaction that we know the residential students are having, but also allow our commuter students to have that same kind of level of success and experience. So. What I want to mention is also what Matt said earlier, is that this is a work in progress. So um, I want to thank especially my colleagues that are here in the room and are part of this effort. I see Kathy Atkins is here and the department chair of math and statistics, Michael Sutherland. Thank you so much for allowing me to share some of our efforts today with this group. So we piloted an effort back in 2013 but also in 2014 in the fall semester. And I'm using fall 2014 because it's the most current data that we have. Um, but we are also planning to move forward and again offer some of these learning communities in fall 2015. So we started out looking at some of the compact scholars and trying to identify some areas where they needed academic improvement. And if you're not familiar with the compact scholars program, there is an insert in your folder somewhere in there that outlines who these students are. But in brief, they're local students from the Sweetwater Union High School District. They all come in college ready, meaning they're not remedial. They're proficient in both EPT and ELM. And we've invested in a partnership with their district since the, these students were seventh graders. And it originated in the year 2000. So we have a long history now in this partnership. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting over getting sick. So, and looking at their academic records and performance, uh, we were able to identify that a good number of our STEM students were struggling, and they were struggling in their first semester in passing pre-calculus, Math 141. And so we decided to invest our efforts in really addressing that need, because again, in alignment with the goal that we want to improve four-year and six-year graduation rates, if these students are not succeeding you know, and hitting the ground running at the start, that's going to delay their progress to degree. So knowing that this was an important course for many of our students to pass, I reached out to um, Kathy Atkins and discussed some of my concerns with her. And fortunately, she was really receptive to understanding what the challenges were. And she shared some of her experiences in her department with another program called MESA. And MESA's been on campus for about 30 years now, and they've succeeded in supporting underserved students in those pathways to the STEM careers. And the model that they've been using involved using undergraduate students for supplemental instruction. So the students would attend the lecture together, 
in Math 141. They'd go to recitation sessions with their graduate assistants, but then they would also have these breakout workshops, which they called workshops, led by undergraduate students that were strong in that area. And they also have been doing that for a number of years and finding it, <coughs> excuse me, to be very successful. So I said, I want to try that. And I want to try it with college-ready compact scholars as a pilot, but I want to tweak it a little bit. And the tweaking involved packaging the Math 141 with a Sci 296 course, which is discussion and analysis. It's one unit of credit. The model that already existed on campus was voluntary. So the students would volunteer to go for that extra support. With the Sci 296, it's not voluntary. It's a one unit course. It's set on their schedule, and they would meet twice a week for 50 minutes with an undergraduate student. So it was part of this greater package. So that's why we called it a learning community, because it's really linking two courses, the Math 141 with the Sci 296. So in this model, what we found is that the students, again, would go to their lecture, would then meet with their graduate assistant for their recitation session. But in addition to that, they would have two 15-minute periods led by an undergraduate student. And what we saw was really positive. And again, I'm sharing data from fall 2014, but we also have it for 2013, and soon enough we'll have it for 2015. But what we saw is that the students that were in the learning community had the additional support provided to them by an ISA, Instructional Student Assistant, an undergrad. They performed higher than the students who were in a comparable group. And in this slide, particularly, the comparable group are other compact scholars. So they're the same profile academic indicators coming in, but they did not have that side 296. So they were just on their own um, trying to figure out how to succeed in that class. So you can see there that, I, think I skipped the slide, anyways. So you can see there that the results were positive. 78% got a C or better in Math 141. Whereas the other 42 students in the non-learning community group, their average was 1.56. So we also looked at their grades at the end of the semester, not just in that one course, but overall how they did on campus. And we saw that the students that had that learning community experience in the fall did better overall with their SDSU GPA. So you could see there that in the red column, that's their SDSU average. The students that had that learning community finished with a 2.43 average compared to a 2.15. So looking at this as another slide here, um, there is a typo there. That should be 45 of 47 students. Let me see if I can use this. That right there should be a 45. Um, overall, you can see that after their first semester, like I said, they did very well. But um, there is some concern on the slide. I don't know if, you could, if your eyes jumped right to the bottom. Right there. That even though they passed Math 141 and they met our goal of graduating, I'm sorry, not graduating, but finishing the course with a C or better, they still had very high academic probation rates. And again, these are college-ready students. And so we're looking at that and trying to examine if there's any other pattern or something that we can address in that area. And our first review, we noticed that there's some other coursework associated with these STEM majors. They're also a high level of challenge, some other science classes. So in the future, we might move to thinking about blocking the math package with another science class so that they can also get supplemental instruction and support in, let's say, Chem 100 or what have you, whatever that is. Because that is still concerning. We don't want to see these students struggle. And the goal is not for them just to pass one class, obviously, right? The goal is for them to do, succeed in all their coursework. And so some of the things we're learning from this pilot inc include the qualitative feedback the students are giving us. And they're telling us that they're learning a lot from their peers that are succeeding in the class because their peers have walked the walk and been in their shoes. And in most cases, the peers have just recently finished that course. So we're talking about like sophomores and juniors who have just taken that class. They know the faculty. They know the school. They know the culture. And so there's really, really strong connection with their students. So we looked not only at 
the comparison group of compact scholars, but we also looked at a comparable population of other local commuters on campus, again, had come in college ready, and we could see that, again, there was still some benefit to having that supplemental instruction. So the students that took Math 141 that were in a comparable population, their um, average grade at the end was 1.99. And so what we're doing now, moving into the fall, is taking some of these practices that we've learned and expanding beyond the compact population. So we work with compact as a pilot, but now in this next fall, we're gonna pilot it with some other local students that are non-compact and see how that works. And while Michael is here, I have to give the math department <coughs> excuse me, a lot of credit for their flexibility and their innovation in really trying to help these students succeed where they're at. And he has been very supportive. There's a faculty member, Janet Bowers, that is our fearless leader in this initiative. And she's looking at this data and getting the feedback from the ISAs, getting the feedback from the students. And we're still tweaking things. You know, a lot has been learned already from just these pilots. But moving forward, they've changed the way that they do their pre-calc and calc 150 sequence all together to benefit all students. So there's a lot to be learned um, from these smaller little pilot initiatives that can benefit all students on campus. So I'll stop there. Are there any questions? Thank you.